All right. So here we go. Alcohols and phenols. So what's the difference between the two? Well, an alcohol would be something, you know, where you have a hydroxyl attached to an sp3 hybridized carbon, you know, something like this, like that, okay? And a phenol is when you have a hydroxyl on an aromatic ring. So this compound itself is called phenol, okay? So we'll look at derivatives of phenols as well. So alcohols and phenols. So alcohols possess a hydroxyl group. So if I say, you know, you've got a hydroxyl group, you should know what a hydroxyl group is, right? Not to be confused with hydroxide. Of course, hydroxide is an ion. A hydroxyl group has no charge. And some examples would be ethanol. And ethanol is the alcohol that's found in alcoholic beverages. So I'm sure that everybody's familiar with that. And then you could have something like cyclopentanol. But what do you notice about these alcohols is that they have all in their suffix. Okay, there's no locant for either of these because it's not required, but I'll get into locants in just a second. And it turns out the hydroxyl groups are very common in naturally occurring compounds. Um, one of them I have on the next slide is one that you would know, which is um, cholesterol. But you can see that this sex pheromone for a boll weevil has a hydroxyl group in it. So not uncommon hydroxyl group here. We have this antibiotic here, which is potent against typhoid, which has two hydroxyl groups in it. Okay, so we have a couple of hydroxyl groups here. Now, again, I know that many of you have studied um, biology in detail, and you would have looked at the phospholipid bilayer and talked about how cholesterol is found in the, in the cell's phospholipid bilayer. Why do we call it cholesterol? Why is the suffix all? Because it has an alcohol in it. It also has an alkene. And it, so there's two functional groups in the compound, but if you remember from organic one, there is a hierarchy of functional groups, and functional groups that contain alcohols have a higher priority than functional groups that solely contain carbon. Um, what else? We have vitamin D3, which has an alcohol in it, right? If you like the smell of cheap perfume or, or geraniums, okay? Geranium odor seems to be like a polarizing smell. Uh, some people love it, some people don't, but geraniol has an alcohol in it. Other places uh, that you would find alcohols would, of course, be in phenols. And you have to memorize the name of phenol. So if you have a benzene ring and you put a hydroxyl on it, that is called phenol. Okay. Where would you find phenol? Well, THC is a place you would find phenol. So if you know what tetrahydrocannabinol uh, is, it has a phenol group in it. Uh, what else? Capsaicin. If you like the taste of chili peppers, you can see that there's a phenol in capsaicin. And then, of course, dopamine. It says if you have a deficiency in dopamine, it causes Parkinson's disease. If you have the right amount or if, if you have a slight excess, I guess it gives you, a, I don't know, a, a pleasant feeling, I guess. And if you have too much dopamine, it can cause schizophrenia. But you see that there is a phenol inside of dopamine. And so um, what's the conclusion we can draw is that in order for an organic chemist to understand you know, biological molecules like vitamins, cholesterol, compounds that create odors like geraniol, um, different, you know, sex pheromones, what else, drugs, uh, dopamine, right, capsaicin, THC. In order for you to understand these kind of compounds and how they would react inside the human body, you have got to know your alcohol chemistry. So, first of all, before we get into you know, tackling the, the reactions of alcohols, we have to learn how to name alcohols. And the good news is, if you know how to name an alkene, naming an alcohol isn't much of a stretch, okay? So alcohols are named using the exact same procedure that we use for alkanes even, just with minor modifications. So just like alkenes, we f try to find the parent chain or the principal chain, the longest carbon chain, but it has to contain the hydroxyl in it. Once you've identified the parent chain, you identify and name the substituents. You provide a locant to each substituent if you need it, okay? You would want to give the carbon with the hydroxyl attached to it the lowest number possible. So let's say you had something like one, two, three, four, five, six carbons, and then you had the hydroxyl here. Well, you would call this two hexanol, not five hexanol, because you want to number it in such a way that you give the hydroxyl group the lowest possible number. So this would be two hex and all. Okay. List the numbered substituents before the parent name in alphabetical order. 
we ignore the prefixes iso, cyclo, and neo. When ordering, uh, ignore prefixes except iso, cyclo, and neo when ordering alphabetically. And then the hydroxyl locan is either placed uh, just before the parent name or just before the all suffix. So you could also call this to, or sorry, sugar. You could call it hexan to all, hexan to all. Either one is completely fine. All right. So let's take a look at some examples. You guys know how to name pentane. Everybody here knows how to name an alkane. And so we would call this compound pentanol. Now, of course, you want to provide a locant. So we have one, two, three, four, five carbons. So technically, this would be one pentanol. Um, you take a look at this compound down here. You can see the longest carbon chain has eight carbons. So it's some kind of octane. Now here, you do have eight carbons in a row, but it doesn't contain the functional group. It doesn't contain the hydroxyl. So we would want to number this one, two, three, four, five, six. So this is some kind of one hexanol. And you see you have a propyl group of carbon two. So you'd call this two propyl um, one hexanol. Two propyl one hexanol. Um, again, if you have an alkene as a functional group, it takes a lower priority than the hydroxyl. And so, um, Again, the hydroxyl takes priority. I'm not going to ask you any questions about naming bifunctional compounds on your quiz, so don't worry about it. Um, uh, yeah, I wouldn't really stress about that. I'm not going to ask you about that. Anyway, we've covered this rule, um, putting the locate at the beginning of the parent or before the all suffix. Either one is totally fine. If you have a cyclic alcohol, well, if you only have one substituent on the ring, like we have here in cyclopentanol, you don't have to call it one cyclopentanol. That's redundant. Okay, there's only one group on there anyway, so the number one is redundant. But if you have more than one group, like here we have the hydroxyl and then we have these two methyl groups, well, in that case, you start numbering at the alcohol and then you give the first substituent the lowest possible number. So this is an R compound because our proton is coming out. So we go one, two, three. So we go like this, which is S. We reverse it because the proton is coming out. And so it's an R compound. So we have R33 dimethyl cyclopentanol. And then we can also use common names for alcohols. So if it's some kind of alkyl group that you recognize, like a butyl, terbutyl, propyl, isopropyl, et cetera, et cetera, you can use those uh, for common names. So here you see an isopropyl group. So you'd call this isopropyl alcohol. Here you see a terbutyl group. So you can call this terbutyl alcohol. Terbutyl alcohol. And here we have a benzyl group. And so you could call this benzyl alcohol, but you could also give it a systematic name like 2-propanol, 2-methyl-2-propanol, or phenylmethanol. Well, I'd actually say that this one would be easier to name as benzyl alcohol, much easier to name as benzyl alcohol. All right. Now, as far as classifying alcohols, we can have primary, secondary, and tertiary carbons. And it turns out that the carbon that is directly attached to the oxygen we call this the alpha carbon. Sometimes it's called the carbonyl carbon. Carbonyl carbon. You might see that if you're perusing the internet, the carbonyl carbon. So if the carbonyl carbon or the alpha carbon is attached to one R group, called a primary alcohol. If it's attached to two, it's a secondary. If it's attached to three, it's a tertiary alcohol. So primary, secondary, and tertiary alcohols. Now, when you have your hydroxyl attached to a benzene ring, it's called a phenol. And so you have to be very astute when you name a phenol because you have to actually look at the compound like this and say, well, here's my phenol, okay? If I'm naming this as a phenol, this has to be carbon number one. So I want to give the second substituent the lowest possible number. So I'd number it one, two, three, four. So if a four chloro, a two nitro. So C comes before N, so it's a four chloro, two nitro phenol. Now, what's the best way to get good at this is to practice it over and over and over. So with that in mind, let's see if we can name some of these alcohols. So we'll start with B. Okay, the B has two stereocenters, so we have to keep that in mind. Now, could anybody tell me how many carbons are in the longest chain in B? And it's not a trick question. Yeah, there's five. Thanks, Rachel. Yeah, absolutely. We've got a total of... Eh, one, two, three, four, five. So this is some kind of one pentanol. 
And then you can see that you've got methyl groups at carbons two, three, and four. So this is two, three, four, trimethyl, one pentanol. So I'm going to scribble that down. Two, eh, two, three, four, trimethyl, one pentanol. Okay, that's the more straightforward part. But now what I want us to do is figure out the stereochemistry at carbons two and three. So it's going to be two something, three something, and then we've got the rest. So we need to figure out is carbon number two an S carbon or an R carbon? So I'll give you a second to take a look at that. Remember that you have a proton going in the back like this. So we're going to have one, two, three. So we're going to be going around like this. So it's going in the counterclockwise direction. So it's going to be 2s. And then did anybody figure out carbon number three? So carbon number three, would that be an S carbon or an R carbon? Yeah, thanks a lot. It's an R carbon, isn't it, right? We're going to be going from one to two to three. So hydrogen's in the back, so it's an R carbon. Good. So it's going to be 2s, 3r, 234, trimethyl, 1 pentanol. Or if you want to be cheeky, I'll just copy and paste this. So copy. We'll paste this down here. We'll change the color to blue. And we'll say you could also call it trimethyl pentan one all. Either one is totally fine. Okay, what's going to be the parent in C? Could anybody tell me what the parent would be? What's the parent compound that's found in C? I'll give you a clue. It's in the title of the chapter. It's this part of the molecule right here. How would you describe that? Exactly, it's a phenol, right? So if it's a phenol, we're gonna number this as carbon number one, two, three, four, five, six. So we've got ethyl groups and carbons two and six. So we'd call this two, six, diethyl, phenol, good. And then the last one has a stereocenter in it as well. This one's a cyclohexanol. So we'd number this, if the hydroxyl carbon is carbon number one, we'd go one, two, three, four. So we've got two, two, four, four tetramethyl cyclohexanol. So two, two, four, four tetramethyl cyclohexanol. And then we have to figure, is this an R compound or an S compound? Well. Our proton is going in the back. So we have one, two, three. So we're going like this. So it's going in a counterclockwise direction. And so this is an S compound. Oops, there we go. So this is S2244 tetramethyl cyclohexanol. Do not confuse these two compounds, okay? Do not confuse cyclohexanol versus phenol. Two very different compounds, aren't they? Right? Why are these so different? Because this carbon is sp2 hybridized and this carbon is sp3 hybridized, okay? So cyclohexanol and phenol are not the same thing, okay? They're very, very different compounds. One is just an alkane with an alcohol attached to it and the other one is an aromatic compound with an alcohol attached to it. So where would we find alcohols in our everyday lives besides in a Coors Light, as I had posted before? Well, methanol is actually the simplest alcohol. It's just a methyl group with a hydroxyl attached to it. Um, it says here, suitable catalyst, with, or with a suitable catalyst, about two billion, two billion gallons of methanol is made from carbon dioxide and hydrogen every year. It's used as a solvent. It's used as a reagent in chemical synthesis. It's used as a fuel. Fun, funny enough, if you like fondue, so fondue, is that how you spell fondue? I guess. Anyhow, if you like fondue, the fuel that they use for fondue, that colorless flame is methanol. Uh, what else? Ethanol. So where do we get ethanol from? So it's produced from the anaerobic um, fermentation of grains. Anyhow, so I guess fermentation is an anaerobic process, but anyhow. Uh, so it says there's all kinds of ethanol made by the acid-catalyzed hydration of ethylene. 
So what this means is that they actually take ethylene and they just treat it with H3O plus and that makes ethanol, okay, which is the same kind of ethanol that you can get from fermentation. Ethanol has so many uses. It's a good solvent. It's good in synthesis. It's good as a fuel. Um, it says here it's denatured to avoid heavy taxes. So what this means, and this is not a joke, is that if you get ethanol in the laboratory, if you're wondering, well, how do they prevent students from taking the ethanol from the lab and just making their own, you know, drinks at home? The reason why is because it's got poison in it. So if you use 99% pure ethanol in the lab, the other 1% is poison, and that's to prevent people from drinking it from human consumption. So um, uh, if you want to get pure 100% alcohol, it's actually very difficult to procure that. But anyhow, human consumption, of course, ethanol is good for drinking and not good for it, but it's used for drinking and it's heavily taxed. Anyhow, I've said enough about that. Isopropanol is rubbing alcohol. So if you go down to Costco, you can buy rubbing alcohol by the gallon, I think. Um, but anyhow, it's made from the acid catalyzed hydration of propylene. So if they take propylene and they treat that with H3O+, plus, you end up with isopropyl alcohol or rubbing alcohol. And it turns out that um, if you have one propanol, you'd have to make that from an anti-Markovnikov addition of, of uh, propylene, but that's an actually, it's actually better um, for killing bacteria. However, it's a better antiseptic. However, it's more expensive to make, so they don't use it. But anyhow, um, isopropanol is used as a solvent, antiseptic, um, obviously, and then a gasoline additive. I think it's added as an anti-knocking agent. But anyhow, I digress. Uh, let's see here. So let's talk about some physical properties of alcohols. At this point, you know, you've passed at least three chemistry classes in your life. So I don't need to teach you about London forces, dipole-dipole forces, and hydrogen bonding by now. But ethane, the only intermolecular force experienced in ethane is going to be London forces because there's no polar bonds in there. Now, of course, chloroethane does have London forces, but there's a polar bond in it. And so, of course, it's going to experience dipole-dipole forces. So that explains why chloroethane has a much, much higher boiling point than ethane, which is a gas down to eight, negative 89 degrees Celsius. Uh, so chloroethane has a boiling point that's 100 degrees higher, but then you go to ethanol and it's got a much, much higher boiling point. Well, why is that? It's because it is capable of what? Hydrogen bonding. And we know that in terms of intermolecular forces, that hydrogen bonding is the strongest, okay? Then you've got dipole-dipole, which are weaker, and then you've got London forces, which are the weakest of all of the intermolecular forces. Now, every one of you should be able to draw a hydroxyl group such as this and show hydrogen bonding occurring between two alcohols. So you see the delta negative on the oxygen, the delta positive on the hydrogen, and then the little dashed line here, this is the line that represents the hydrogen bonding. Now, hydrogen bonding, it's just a strong dipole-dipole force. It is not a bond. It's not a covalent bond, but it is a very strong intermolecular force, and that explains why alcohols have such high boiling points. Some other physical properties of alcohols, if you're a student, and I know you all are, you probably said, well, an alcohol like methanol or ethanol or isopropanol or butanol or pentanol, whatever, they have a hydrophobic region, which is water-hating, and then they have a hydrophilic region, which is water loving. And so what does that mean? It means alcohols that are gonna dissolve in water are gonna have very small carbon chains. And so the rule is this, if you have less than three carbons, it's gonna be an alcohol that will mix with water. Once you get into higher numbers of carbons, the alcohols tend not to mix with water whatsoever. And then once you get up to octanol, so here we have one, oops. Here we have, come on, pen. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This molecule, one octanol, one octanol, is not miscible with water whatsoever. In fact, if you put it in a test tube, okay, if you mix it with water, the octanol is going to be on the top and the water is going to be on the bottom. So they are not mixable whatsoever. This section on antibacterial properties of alcohols this is um, something that's covered in detail in the chapter. So it explains to you why something that's an antibacterial 
has to have a hydrophobic region and a hydrophilic region. And it says once you get around, I don't know, this many carbons, something around eight carbons, it maximizes antimicrobial um, properties. I'm not gonna ask you about that, but for my students who are interested in a career in medicine, it is very, very interesting. So I'll leave that as an FYI for now. So if you take a look at a compound like hexyl resorcinol, you can see it does have hydrophilic regions, okay, water-loving regions, but it's got this big old water-hating region that is nonpolar. So what's the, what's, the, um, what's the outcome of all this is that it has a combination of both hydrophobic and hydrophilic regions. And so it makes a really good antimicrobial or antibacterial and antifungal agent. But again, I'll let you read that in the textbook. This is linked to this section right here, which I'll leave as an FYI. I won't ask you any questions about that. So let's get into something that's a little bit more exciting, and that is acidity of alcohols and phenols. I know you're just waiting for a chat about PKAs. So let's talk about ways that we could deprotonate an alcohol. Well, you guys should remember the alcohols have PKAs that are around 16. I know that they vary, okay? We'll just put close to 16. So if we think about alcohol as being an acid and a hydride as being a base, we would think of the ethoxide as being the conjugate base and hydrogen gas as being the conjugate acid. Well, it turns out that hydrogen gas has a PKA that is around 36, okay? So what does that mean? If you remember, the equilibrium is gonna to lie to the side of the weaker acid. So that means that the equilibrium is gonna to lie to this side. So that means that sodium hydride is very effective at deprotonating alcohols. It's a very good base for deprotonating alcohols. Now, what are some other ways that we could make alkoxides? We can also use sodium, potassium, or lithium metal to do the same kind of thing. So if you take an alcohol like ethanol and you treat it with a metal like sodium, you actually end up with your sodium ethoxide, shown here, and you liberate hydrogen gas along the way. So metals are also good ways of um, making alkoxide. So now we have two ways to make an alkoxide. Now, if you're rusty on what is an alkoxide, well, an alkoxide is just the conjugate base of an alcohol, right? If you take an alcohol and you deprotonate it, if it loses H+, you end up with an alkoxide. Now, here they're comparing... Um, the conjugate base of an alkane versus the conjugate base of an amine. This is called an amide. Okay, not to be confused with an amide that contains oxygen. And then this is called a halide. These are the conjugate bases of the halogens. And you can see that the instability increases as we go from a carbon with a negative charge to a nitrogen with a negative charge to an oxygen with a negative charge to a halogen with a negative charge. Why would that be? Well, you know that the periodic table goes like this, okay? And we know that fluorine is the most electronegative element, and so it's the one that's the most comfortable with stabilizing a negative charge. Then you have oxygen, nitrogen, and then carbon. So you might need to review area, atom resonance induction orbital. And that gives us a rationale as to why the pKa of an alcohol is lower or more acidic than the pKa of an amine, because the negative charge on an amine is less comfortable than the negative charge on an oxygen. Why? Because oxygen is more electronegative, so on and so forth. And so the pKa of an alcohol is usually somewhere between 15 and 18. Now, what about a phenol? It turns out that the pKa of a phenol is much, 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 much higher, or sorry, much, much lower, so much more acidic, okay, than that of an alcohol. If you compare uh, cyclohexanol and phenol, you see that phenol is 10 to the power of eight times more acidic than cyclohexanol. Well, why would that be? If you think of aereo, it can't be because of atom, because if I was to draw the conjugate base of cyclohexanol, okay, if it lost a proton, you'd end up with this alkoxide. So either way, the negative charge ends up on an oxygen. But if we think of resonance, this compound has no resonance structures, whereas if we draw the conjugate base of phenol, which we call phenoxide, so this is a phenoxide, it has a total of, you can see here, four resonance contributors, one, two, three, four, and then you go right back to the beginning again. And so it's resonance that we use to explain why phenol is so much more acidic than cyclohexanol. 
Now, what about if I compare these two alcohols, ethanol and trichloroethanol? So this is actually 222 trichloroethanol, but you see that this compound is much more acidic than this one. Well, if we think about their conjugate bases, if I draw the ethoxide, I have the negative charge on an oxygen, fine. If I draw, so I'll just put Cl3, CH2, oh, minus like that. Okay, there's the conjugate base of this compound. Well, now I have the, the negative charge on an oxygen here as well. So if I think in terms of aereo, I can't use atom to explain the difference in pKa. I can't use resonance because there's no um, resonance forms, but I can use induction. Right, because the three chlorines attached to this carbon, if I pencil them in, right, those all have a dipole going towards the chlorine, which pulls the negative charge in and serves to stabilize it. And so the conjugate base of trichloroethanol is much more stable than the conjugate base of ethanol. And that's why the pKa is so much lower. Now, in terms of if you compare ethanol and terbutanol, you see that ethanol is much more, well, 10 to the power of two. So that's a hundred times more acidic than terbutanol. Why would that be? I can't use atom. I can't use resonance. I can't use induction and I can't use orbital. So why would it be? It's nothing that's explained by aereo. It's explained by something called a solvation effect. If you look at the conjugate bases of ethanol versus terbutanol, you can see that the terbutoxide ion hysterically hindered by the terbutyl group. And so what that means is you can have less solvent molecules come around that negative charge to stabilize it. Whereas with ethoxide, here's our negative charge, but you can get much more solvent molecules around it to stabilize it. And that explains why ethoxide is a hundred, or sorry, eth ethanol is a hundred times more acidic than terbutoxide. So it isn't always a, um, an effect that can be explained by area. So what I'd like you to do before our next class is I'd like you to read section 12.3 through to the end of chapter 12, because we've covered these uh, reactions already. And what we'll do is we'll cover these um, reactions when we meet on Wednesday. So we'll do this on May 15th. Okay, we'll tackle these reactions first.